Okay, so harm reduction in the drugs field was really a result of the HIV pandemic. Um, it wasn't something that was automatically part of drug treatment and services in this country. Um, and, and by the way, I'm going to try and focus as much as possible on the UK. So it's never been illegal to have needle exchange in this country, which is not that common. So researchers and clinicians got together at the beginning of the HIV pandemic and did some research that proved pretty much without a doubt that if we could provide clean needles and medication to people who are currently chemically dependent, we would be at least stemming the HIV epidemic. Um, unfortunately, in Scotland, when the HIV epidemic started, the police were stopping people on the street and confiscating their, their ne any paraphernalia, injecting paraphernalia. The consequence of that was, of course, people were sharing one or two needles that they had as part of their own lives. And the city of Edinburgh became known as the HIV capital of Europe for some years. Um, London was, you know, less dramatic, but still, it, it was, you know, people were caught unawares. Now, let me just say, as a definition, harm reduction basically accepts people where they are with their drug use and tries to ameliorate the greatest harms. That is the definition of harm reduction in the drug scale. So we're talking about HIV, hepatitis, other infections that have killed people, and uh, crime, actually, because if people have legal supplies from doctors of anopia or whatever the drug of their addiction is, we are um, less likely to have all the other problems that come with drug use. I mean, in fact, some people argue that the only real harm reduction is to legally regulate the entire drug market, but we'll maybe get to that later. Having methadone or heroin in some cases, not many I might add, means that people don't have to use the illegal drug market, so they're not at risk of arrest and so on. So some people will argue, well, even if they have a legal supply of methadone, for example, which is not the drug they really want, they're still going to go and buy uh, heroin. And in fact, I have to admit that when I was using, I certainly did sell methadone and get heroin with the money that came. But we don't really know. People will argue it's over 50% of the people on the street that do that. We don't really know what percentage it is. It's certainly, you know, it's substantial and it's important to recognize. But over time, if the services are really person centered, uh, you know, you can work with people to help them come off drugs. And my own personal experience was that going down the harm reduction route actually got me off drugs quicker. I had done several years previous to, uh, I mean, basically I stopped around 82 and then went into rehab. And then there was a lot of chaos in and out of rehab. I had five years off and relapsed again in 91. And then that window of time using again between 91 and 93 was very reduced in terms of you know everything in my life was a lot more stable um you know because i didn't have to commit crime i had a legal supply i didn't have to share needles there was nothing i had to do that was going to put me either at risk of arrest or hiv infection or even hepatitis so that was a great huge change in my life um and i think people who inject drugs in Switzerland and other parts of the world who have access to legal supplies um, in the morning and evening. Does everybody know about Switzerland at the other end of this? Um, no, okay. but, um, but, but so um, Peter, just ask you where you were calling from. Are you in the UK or Australia? Oh, I'm in London. North You're in London. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So my name's Andrea. F. Thimu Mordon, and I, after the death of my late husband, 
who died of AIDS. I set up an HIV, uh, excuse me, yeah, it was an HIV and drugs NGO to uh, basically mobilize and organize drug users against the HIV pandemic. And that was our, our main focus at the time. But, and, you know, it became quite political very quickly because I realized that to get what we needed, you know, it meant lobbying all sorts of either high profile psychiatrists or MPs, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, as an advocate over and over again, what I was finding is that, you know, I could put a band aid on, I could get people methadone, but I couldn't really hit the system as an advocate that was making drug users' lives so difficult. And that's, um, you know, harm reduction can, you know, prevent HIV across the world. We've reduced it in many places where policies are not so insane as in Russia, Iran, China. I mean, Southeast Asia and Russia are now the epicenters of the HIV pandemic in the world. You had questioned before about uh, harm and um, having an end on the war of drugs. Yeah, because um, I mean, from my um, from the research that I've sort of uh, read, um, it appears that uh, when when we try to punish those uh, the consumers of drugs, yeah. um, it it doesn't work as well as. Um, other countries where they've uh, legalized drugs or decriminalized drugs and yeah. start to tackle um, start to tackle those who sell drugs and the suppliers of drugs from abroad. Um, so yeah, it was just uh, just a general question. Do you think that in order for us to make some real progress, that we need to actually end this war on drugs and completely Absolutely. change our approach if to drugs. If the was there, we could slow down so much damage and wastage of money and crime and HIV and, I mean, all of these things. I mean, some of the most knowledgeable people on the planet, we've had Kofi Annan on our side, heads of the WHO, the UN, uh, AIDS groups. I mean, The Lancet apparently had 106 peer-reviewed papers that concluded that the war on drugs and the criminalization of this group of people was, you know, it was unconscionable really in the end in terms of what happens to people. So absolutely, but that is why we need harm reduction because at the moment we can't make politicians effectively legalize those people. So we yeah. have to do everything we can in the immediate to prevent HIV, more crime, more hepatitis, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a kind of simple answer to your question. Uh, not very simple, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Because <laughs> in the end, that's what it comes down to, a huge amount of campaigning and lobbying. And, and let me just tell you about what I would see as more advanced models of harm reduction. So Switzerland, which actually, you know, quite a conservative country and so on and so on, put a referendum, put a referendum together and it, 68% of the people said, absolutely, we would support heroin programs and safer injection rooms. So three cities in Switzerland have actually for well over a decade now had, pla have had places where people come in the morning and the evening and get their injection or oral supply, whatever it is. And then they go off and do their life. And surprise, surprise, reduction in HIV infections, uh, crime and so on. The patients in this program- Sorry, I've just got, because um, I, I was reading the government's report on, okay. um, on drugs that they commissioned in uh, 2013, which is a comparative analysis. And they've got a little summary of uh, the Swiss system and the okay. Portuguese system. So okay. I was just reading that. Um, sorry, yeah. No, no, it's fine. No, it's fine. I mean, S Switzerland is a very good model. Portugal, for me, is the better model because it actually de decriminalizes all personal use. Um, and therefore, you know, p people are at risk of, you know, more money in prisons and so on and, you know, being disrupted in their lives. Um, 
but let me just say, from our point of view as ex-injection drug users and activists, Portugal, as excellent as it may seem now, did not happen until 1% of the entire population was already dependent on heroin. Gosh. That is a lot of people. I mean, when I was first told that, and I've been in this field a long time, I was utterly, I mean, I actually didn't believe it. I said, that can't possibly be true. And because I thought they meant that maybe 1% of the population was taking cannabis or whatever, but actually 1% of the population was always dependent on heroin. So they got together officials and activists and physicians and so on, and decided that something radical and different had to happen. And that's what they came up with. Now, when people are stopped with a drug that is deemed, <coughs> I mean, you know, because things aren't legal, they're just decriminalized. If the they go to a panel of professionals who work in the drugs field. If this panel thinks that the person needs help with their drug problem, in inverted commas, because sometimes they're not problematic drug users at all, not from their point of view, they will be referred to counsellors and physicians and so on for help. Uh, am I being clear at the moment about what I'm saying here? Yes. Yeah. Good checking, good, good. So that's Portugal. Switzerland has Zurich, Bern, and another city that has these heroin programs people use in the morning and in the evening on site. So if there's any overdoses or other problems with people's health, like abscesses or uh, needing help with housing or any other social problems, they can do it right there and then get some help. So, um, you know, for me, speaking as an ex-injection drug user, the important things about these programs is that they don't immediately pressure you into, you know, you've got to come off drugs, that's the only way to be, et cetera, et cetera. Because most of us run straight out the door when we're put through that. Uh, so they're saying, here you are, here's the thing, what do you want to do about it? And so you're also treated with more respect if you think about it. Um, mm. And I think that's enormous uh, when you're talking about a group of people whose self-esteem is famously somewhere at gutter level if not below and the war on drugs of course just increases that makes that worse politicians what they do and do you know anything about people what no, their view on drugs um I, I, although i know I, my, my studies a different area but i my day job is actually in public health mm. and i'm I, I used to work in the department of health Oh, right. and, um, and so I'm, I'm sort of broadly familiar with, with, with the argument and I know um, I, I'm personally sympathetic with, with, your, with your case. Okay. Um, I, I suppose, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a big political shift to achieve, isn't it? It's a big attitudinal shift. Public perceptions are oh. part of it. It's not about actual harm, it's to do with public perceptions of risk. Right. That's always a problem with any kind of public health matter because what, what people believe, especially in the, 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 the days of social media and, um, um, and the evidence base are often wildly divergent. Yeah. Um, I know there are champions for decriminalization like David Nutt, for example. Yes. Um, there are prominent um, campaigners for that. So. It's really, you know, what do you think are the reasons that it's, uh, there, is, there is a clearly arguable case uh, and it's ridiculous that some commonly used recreational drugs are illegal in my view. Some of the hallucinogen, hallucinogens, for example, which are pretty yeah. harmless. Yeah. Um, but um, there's a lot of public resistance and I wonder what you think the reasons for that are. Well, I can tell you what people argue. Uh, the first thing is, for example, around heroin prescribing, that they will say it's more expensive because you have right. to buy clean needles with the drug itself, and you may be having two or three vials a day, which mm. is more expensive than you know a little bottle of methadone. That's one argument. Yeah. Uh, the other argument, of course, is that you know if you do that, nobody's ever going to want to come off drugs, which is really arguable, I think, particularly. Mm. You know based on other people's experiences 
Uh, yeah. My experience, lots of people where they have de decriminalized drugs already, mm. we don't see huge increases. In fact, particularly amongst my kind of drug user, mm -hmm. in my case, people, you know, you know, because half the, from my point of view, this is why I see it, half the drama is very attractive. You know, half the reason we get attracted to get, to get into the use of these drugs is because they are kind of, you know, it's daring and it really shows that you're cool and whatever. Uh, yeah. Once you take that away, it becomes yeah. less intriguing, I think. Um, but I think probably the key reason is that, or well, certainly right now, the people are ahead of the politicians in terms of seeing all this mm. uh, and understanding all this. And because we have every four years a new government or five years or whatever it is in this country, mm. and the new administration has to learn what is going on around yes. all these different issues, including drugs. And usually mm. what happens is that uh, the electorate are duped into believing, you know, all these governments going to be hard on crime and the causes of crime. Everybody mm. hears drugs, or lots of people hear drugs. Um, they are frightened, basically, sure. of taking mm. the next courageous step in terms of changing legislation. You know. So, I mean, I don't know really how many more knowledgeable, intelligent, powerful people have to inform them about the dangers of criminalizing, particularly injection drug users around the world. Um, before there is some, I went to the ACMD a couple of years ago and asked them directly, the Advisory Council for the Misuse of Drugs, why had we not adopted the Portuguese model, which had seen rap, you know, rapid reductions in HIV, hepatitis, everything that comes along with injection drug use, illegal injection drug use. And <coughs> there was just kind of, you know, there was no real answer. There was a, answers of vagary and we're not really ready and we're not really sure this is the right way to go and we already have harm reduction programs anyway. In other words, uh, but really I think the bottom line is it's not, deemed as being acceptable by the electorate, which is weird because, you know, we've even had the Sun and some of the more mm. uh, reactionary newspapers support decriminalization. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I suspect that right now, you know, the bigger issues of Brexit and... Oh, there's a full legislative program. It's soaked yeah. up. Yeah, exactly. And acknowledge and also talk to people about this that you know, those programs in other parts of the world are not, you know, free-for-alls. It's not, you know, you go to the Zurich clinic, pick up your heroin, off you go. You have to use it there in the program, in the house, in the clinic. And you are, in some ways, therefore, your privacy is curtailed to some degree. Um, and, you know, we know from the evidence that actually people are coming off drugs slightly quicker in the heroin programs, which for me personally doesn't surprise me at all because once your, you know, the resistance movement against you, if you like, is reduced, then it becomes less exciting and interesting. I know this probably sounds absolutely bonkers, but I am telling you the truth as I understood it. No, me. it's what, it's an experience I, I've, you know, I've heard people relate the same experience, yeah. but there are different experiences of opiate dependency, aren't there, for yeah. example, I think yeah. It, the, the, the massive situation in America at the moment yes. has a lot of very complex social causes, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And to do with the availability of prescription opiates as yeah. well. Yeah. So I don't know, Maya Selovitz came online on Twitter yesterday saying that the problems that you just referred to actually were, were not, you know, because the the message that's coming from the establishment at the moment is that 80% of those who are ending up in trouble with prescription opiates were prescribed them by doctors. That's not the case. They came from right. the illicit scene and then got uh, prescription drugs because it was the only way that they could get what they really needed. Uh, so it's, you know, we, we're constantly up against 
what is the truth establishment says as opposed to what reformers are talking about and that obviously is another thing that is not helping this cause you know um and i i wish that yeah i really believed at this stage i sometimes feel like pulling my hair out mm. uh, you know that we're still being forced to force fed this line that it because we really care and we want to deter people from taking drugs well <laughs> You know, these laws haven't deterred millions of people around the world, so I don't know why they even think we'll be listening to that anymore. I mean, anybody who's thinking about it. Um, let me just get back to my uh, thing that I prepared. Um, just to acknowledge that in the early days of the HIV pandemic in this country, uh, you probably all know this, but... Um, the lesbian and gay community spearheaded the appropriate response to HIV almost 50 years ago, as in many countries they were badly affected and therefore had some idea of what to do with it. They were also better equipped to respond as in politically organized as a constituency. They were moneyed in some cases and already held high office as MPs, for example, though many remain closeted. I'm talking back in the 1980s. My own experience of many lesbians and gay men is that they are often much more creative in their responses to life, the universe and everything. <laughs> um, I was on recently on World AIDS Day, we did a tour bus around the city of London and it was, well, it was, you know, it's a, what a great idea to make aware pe people around the city about HIV than actually be there literally on the street with red ribbons and banners talking about the need to save the NHS and so on and so on. And people could talk to us from the street onto the bus. Um, anyways, after 30 years, I still contribute to the nonviolent direct action of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, ACT UP, which has an impressive history of 35 years of HIV activism beginning in San Francisco. Yeah, so apparently it's 80% of peer-reviewed studies have said that criminalizing drug users over several years has, criminal, you know, the criminal, what we've already talked about. I'm getting my tongue getting in a twist here. Mm. These are studies from North America and Asia, Eastern Europe, South America and the Middle East. I mean, all over the world. Uh, people in, because people who inject drugs are 28 times more at risk of HIV compared to the general population. And geographically, Eastern Europe and Central Asia make up the majority of new HIV infections. Mm. Um, Michael Michal Kazachin, I can't say his name, but he's a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, has said that criminalizing drug users is unnecessary, harmful, and, and because they're not largely causing harm to others, he doesn't see why it continues. It is estimated that there are 11.7 million people injecting drugs globally, of which 14% are HIV positive. I mean, in this country, we're now talking about hundreds, which is pretty staggering, but we pretty much from the early days of the epidemic, so it's staggeringly low, I mean, compared to other countries, but we pretty much always had, uh, we didn't always have clean needles, but we certainly had legal supplies of methadone or heroin mm. before the late 70s, before that was changed from heroin to methadone. Sorry, this is not my particular area of public health, so I'm happy to be corrected, but the, the heroin using population in the UK, is, it's got quite an older age profile, hasn't it? Now it does, because yeah. we've, I mean, it's like this has also happened in Holland and other countries mm. in Europe and Australia, harm reduction has essentially made it less attractive. I mean, I, I can't, you know, I, I can't really, in terms of, you know, the, there is some legal supply of heroin to very few. There is a lot of legal supply of methadone, although some quite often not enough mm -hmm. to hold people, hence the illegal market still thrives. But the reality is that the attraction is not as big as it used to be, but also because, you know, one way or the other, legal or not, cannabis has become more of a 
it's certainly not a drug that is as criminal, you know, the people who use it are not as criminalized as they used to be. No. Um, so, and it's clear from some research that people who come off opiates and stop injecting, who find, you know, find some health gain from just smoking marijuana or just eating it or whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, emotionally or physically it has the same benefit, but without all the other stuff that goes with it. And since the police are less likely these days to stop you, unless you happen to be a young black male, mm -hmm. then there is a three times higher proportion of uh, likelihood that you will get stopped and have drug taken off you and perhaps even more in the prison, uh, in the custody suites. Um, you know, that's another reason. I'm trying to get to all the reasons of the aging population. I mean, the things that are important also to focus on is that right now in the UK, we have a massive problem with drug-related deaths, which always happens when we backtrack on harm reduction, mm -hmm. which has happened in the last five to 10 years. Yeah, I've noticed that, yeah. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of what people hear about or see, everything is about recovery. And I must say that it hasn't really helped having Russell Brand as, you know, because actually he's very good on the criminalization issue. He's very good on lots of issues as far as I'm concerned, but he has not helped in terms of maintaining harm reduction. Now, of course, he can't be blamed for the whole thing. He was a perfect pawn in the government's what they really wanted to do anyway, to back mm. up on uh, harm reduction policies. So, um, but yeah, the truth is now we have thousands of people, which we didn't have before, dying of drug related deaths because all of the things that they need are not as easily accessible, um, which we've talked about repeatedly in the last 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my friends, I was hoping he could come here, Kevin Jaffrey, has been a great stalwart promoter of this uh, medication called naloxone, which you may have heard about, which reverses drug uh, opiate related overdoses. Mm. Yeah. And we have been working hard campaigning to access um, naloxone across the country. And it is possible now for a family member or somebody who's close to somebody who's injecting opiates to get a prescription for naloxone. But, you know, again, where women are concerned and there are children involved, they don't necessarily want to expose the fact that they're in a family where injection drug use is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, so we've also been trying to get the drug itself into the drug using community because that makes more sense yeah ultimately to have it there so that if people are using together and one person kills over because that's often what happens people are using together you know just as a social event mm. one person kills over and people get afraid they sometimes will even leave the body call the police and just leave the body to be taken away because they could be uh, blamed yeah. for the overdose. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's where we're at with that. Um, and they also have nasal, uh, a nasal variation of a naloxone now, which I think is probably, I mean, I don't know, some drug injectors or ex particularly injectors will say that they don't like to have to inject anybody with naloxone because it brings back past memories. And I think that probably is true for some people. But I think the reality is if you're with a dying friend, you won't really care how you're going to get that drug into their body, mm. whether it's nasal or, you know, through the nose or any which way, you're going to act fast. So that is also another really uh, useful way to save lives. Yeah, so really harm reduction, that's what it's mainly, mainly about. It's about saving lives and reducing all the other social chaos that goes with yeah. using on the streets. I mean, you know, we've had police officers. I don't know if you guys are aware of a group called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And mm -hmm. they are uh, often ex-police officers, quite high-ranking people who have come together and to say the war on drugs is a complete failure mm -hmm. and they want to reverse it. And, you know, interestingly enough for me is they have actually been some of the most staunch 
advocates of heroin prescribing, for example, which I find, you know, staggering. But they're talking about their experiences as police officers in the front line, dealing with particularly so-called, what is it, the, the word, um, when you're a recidivist, essentially, prolific drug criminals, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I find it amazing, really, that, because actually the, um, Jack Cole and Tom Lloyd, Tom Lloyd is an officer from this country, Jack's in the States, they've done uh, events together. Actually, there was a launch of law enforcement against prohibition Europe a couple of years ago in our UK parliament. And they have said that for that group of people who are chronically dependent mm. on these drugs and also seem to have, you know, long histories of crime, they would really strongly argue that they should have injection heroin. Yeah. And that therefore our government is really being negligent to not, you know, think about safer injection rooms and heroin prescribing in an organized way as in Switzerland and Germany and Australia and lots of countries around the world. This is not rocket science anymore. You know, it's not to us. I mean, <laughs> to be honest, how I feel now is that we've really done a backward turn in the last few years. And um, the best route most of us see at the moment to even getting this on the table, the issue of drug policy reform, is to take the medical marijuana uh, issue because we now know that even little children can be helped with neurological damage by small doses um, of marijuana. So, you know, AIDS, wasting syndrome, bad appetites, glaucoma in the eyes, endless numbers of things have been ameliorated or certainly reduced significantly by the use of marijuana. So. <laughs> You, you, sorry, I interrupted you. It's all right. No, I, I, um, I actually one of the areas I work with in public health is is, mm. is cancer education. Okay. And I, I, I lobby for for various cancer related issues, and um, I've known people with terminal diagnoses, and uh, there's a lot of interesting research into the use of LSD and hallucinogens okay. yeah. for, for for helping to deal with the psychological effects yeah. of a terminal diagnosis. Yes which are hugely interesting. And uh, to me, that's something really worth pursuing because Absolutely. having known people with a terminal diagnosis and the psychological torment they live with, yeah. you saw a friend who died last year, yeah. gosh, you know, if I'd known that I would have gone out and bought it myself for yeah. her, you know? Yeah. Um, and to me that the, this whole, I suppose it's a cultural thing of crack. We use, they, <laughs> we use the word drugs and that actually, covers a wide span of Absolutely. Uh, different chemicals and organic compounds and yes it's just a buzzword yeah. and it, it, yeah. it's it's something from the 1960s it's quite mm -hmm. extraordinary you know hip, hippies and that kind of thing and and it's still got that emotive power and yet yeah. there are um you know mushrooms and cannabis and yeah. and, and and heroin they're, they're completely different substances and yeah. the, but they're all under the same umbrella so, yeah and they'll be very and they've all got potentially useful absolutely roles in the right circumstances yeah. Yeah. um and this is i suppose it's getting over that cultural it's getting more i i, I guess it's getting a wider spectrum of people to lobby for this mm. and you talked about the gay rights movement and mm -hmm. i think you know in the early stages i think stonewall often say that um, in the early days of the gay rights movement, it was very much a, a sort of, I suppose, a bit of a left-wing ghetto. That's not a, a, diffi a, a difficult thing to say. And Stonewall began to make progress when they realised, you know, actually, gay people can be Tory too. And we're all, this is yeah. not a party political matter. Absolutely. It totally it's a political matter, but not a party political matter. No, absolutely. And I guess you, what this needs is advocates across the board. Yes in the Tory party, in mm. conservative institutions, yes. to, to, to break down that taboo that it's yes. uh, some kind of libertarian lunacy, I guess. Yeah. No, it's a factual thing. No, I'm just, I'm just thinking because I, I would like to know Peter. He has question, but he doesn't say. I would like him to talk a little bit about what he's thinking, and 
also I would like to know what support support want to, to, to get out of this. You know, just try to, 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 to get a conversation so everyone can take home something. The first point I made, Andre, in the chat was that it's a very good point you made about new governments wanting to be seen to be changing everything when they come in. Mm. What we actually need, I think, as a suggestion, mm. is an agency with a much longer time scale view. And that's mm. an absolute must, in my opinion. You know, you're looking like 20 years, 25 years. Mm. That way, there is a chance that longer term policies could be raised, put in, discussed in public, etc., etc. So there's a whole set of baggage comes with it, but that is my positive suggestion. Mm. I made an observation on the Swiss thing, yes. that the trial was partially ignited because parents completely lost it, because their kids were stumbling over used needles in yes. parks that were used yes. by their children. Yes. And that was one of the reasons that those trials got started in Zurich and banned elsewhere. Yes. Um, and that's a problem in many cases. Yes. In the UK have as well. Yes. Bristol was mentioned last year in the press as a particularly bad area. Yes. And then the third point I made for you is a horrific data point that I discovered recently, which is in the States, they're finding that cocaine is now not being cut with rat poison or whatever, it's being cut with fentanyl, yes. which is one of the strongest yes. opiates yes. that we know of. I know. And the result is, of course, a hell of a lot of uh, deaths from cocaine parties and that it seems that the cynical bastards excuse my french are targeting the black and brown communities yes that's just terrible because it converts a psychological dependency in the main yes. into a physical one yeah yeah it's just okay. awful I, I can't believe that but anyway those are the three points i made hun. yeah yeah, we're, we're waiting for the fentanyl crisis in this country. I mean, what we generally find is whatever's going on in the US will happen here eventually around drugs. Uh, it may not happen quite as intensely, but it will happen. So can I just get back to what was your first point, Peter? Um, my point was that a, a drug czar and agency oh, right. with yeah. a 20 year time scale i.e. outside of the election cycle yes. in the stupid political process we have of antagonistic party politics. Yes. That's what we need is a neutral yes. layer above it. And do you see that as being um, government or non-governmental? <clears throat> I, I would see it as something, perhaps the nearest analogy yes. uh, could be something like the cabinet office. It's okay. an advisory body, but in this case, it would be one with a longer um, life cycle mm. that all of the parties and lords and ladies up in the commons and lords had agreed to as saying, here is a suggestion that actually could be useful. That's how I see it. Yes, absolutely. And we do have the Advisory Council for the Misuse of Drugs who have been around for many, many years. And they're there really to advise the government, but they tend to only get onto the advisable council with the misuse of drugs if they are within the status quo already and not likely to rock the boat in any way and that start advocating decriminalization or legal regulation and that's the problem we have so uh, the closest thing we have right now to what you're suggesting i think is probably transform you know them based in Bristol. So they're an NGO who have been promoting legal regulation for a long time, putting all the evidence on the table, the statistics, comparing what we do to other people. And, you know, I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm uh, losing my thread here. Just <laughs> so frustrating, you know, to have to, you know, we've been talking about the same things over and over again. Maybe what we haven't done very well in this country compared to the US, say, for example, where they now have pretty much legalized cannabis in so many states, is being in the corridors of power over and over again and lobbying and being very, uh, um, just more intense about it and over time. And also that I think there probably is, certainly in my experience, a covert or not so covert refusal to work across partisan lines politically which is not very helpful you know um but 
as I was going to say earlier, Volte Face, V O L T E Face, which means about turn apparently in Italian, is a magazine that started up about three years ago. And actually, its head is Stephen Moore, who is a conservative. The, all of the group of men and women who work there and write for the magazine are, you know, they're not all the same. Some are Green, some are Labour, <laughs> some are Tory. And that, as far as I'm aware, is about the only group at this moment where the uh, variation exists. But of course, it is just a magazine. Um, I think it's a great idea, Peter, but I can't see, uh, you know, if David Nutt, who set up another scientific advisory mm. group, could have, you know, a lot more funding to do what he's doing, um, that might be another way. Yeah, or we could use groups that have political clout and access like yeah. Nesta yeah. and get them to pick it up and say to Jeff Mulgan, who's their CEO, who I know, is this something, Jeff, that's worth picking up as an idea and running with? Because he's Sorry. really doing a lot with health lately. Who, Nesta? Jeff Mulgan, M-U-L-G-A. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, Jeff, yeah. Um, but I'm going to be seeing him. I've booked uh, an argument with him in a in about 10 days, I can run that one up the flagpole oh, and see what he says. Yeah. He's a researcher, right? He used to work for government and so on. Yeah, he used to be the head of Demos and then he used to be in the cabinet office, all sorts of places. Yeah. He's a very, very powerful and influential man. Nice yeah. man. Nice man. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's one or two of these creatures about that actually have a lot of clout behind the scenes with yeah. government. Those are the people yeah. we've got to hit. Yeah. The, the mechanisms that are already... Uh, there um, in the current sort of NHS structure. Um, I mean, you've got uh, NICE, uh, you have the clinical commissioning groups and the health and wellbeing boards. Um, I mean, they, they must have some sort of strategy towards drug use and harm reduction. Um, so isn't there a way to sort of target those? Yeah, NICE has been really supportive in terms of harm reduction. But in the end, if there isn't a big enough lobby to make government change its, you know, priorities and opinions and legislation, it's, it's, you know, it's not impossible. We, I mean, in the end, may I say, you know, you were the one who first mentioned the war on drugs. We need to build a wide, you know, cross culture, cross religion, cross political lines movement to end the war on drugs in this country. You know, the reason the Americans have actually done so well so far, and we thought, you know, once the Americans started to shift, the whole world would go down quickly, or go up quickly, more to the point. Um, uh, but we haven't really done that as well. I mean, we really, I see the, the cannabis lobby, uh, you know, we're all down at Parliament, and there are speeches on the street, and then we go in and lobby r and and so on. But, you know, they're... And they're doing brilliantly. I think they're the most inspiring of all the reform groups for me because they're sick people saying, hell no, this is not acceptable. You know, this medicine, we have to get, we could get arrested for taking it. It's ridiculous. You know, so they're a very powerful and moving uh, force for good. Um, and I think their leadership with the help of Paul Flynn and other politicians um, has been you know, great, it's greatly inspiring to me. I mean, it's greatly inspiring to anybody, I think, who sees them. Um, headed up by Jonathan Liebling, who's um, up in Reading there. Um, but I think that's... And what happened in the States is, of course, they had a lot more funding. And, you know, I'm, I'm now trying to sort of look at our own movement in the, in the United Kingdom and see where we fail. And I think one of the ways that we fail is that we don't connect enough. While I support the idea of people's freedom to, to use personally i i have um t i'm in two minds about the, the cannabis lobby and and the what's happening in the u.s because uh as somebody who's, who's campaigned a lot against the tobacco lobby mm -hmm. i see it as you know it could be the same thing and you know there are risks there are risks involved in in oh, yeah. cannabis consumption and particularly cannabis smoking as well uh, that public health people have fought for years to grapple with with the tobacco industry yeah 
um, and there are business interests there as well. Yeah, so it's not I will say one thing is that after 30, 40 years of essentially negativizing, if you like, the mm. you know the way that we view tobacco, we have actually reduced and, and you know asking people to smoke outside and yeah, yeah. You know, so it becomes less interwoven woven in our that's right, yeah lives. We have it's got not, reduction right, it's glamorized, it's yeah. completely based on health education really. Yeah. And health yeah. promotion. So you know one way or the other, any changes that we make are not going to be seen for a very long time. No, that's true. You know, yeah. I think I think there is an issue around profiteering, but I think yeah. you know where there is money to be made, the fat cats will jump in there. Um, but you know, in Colorado, they've also funded schools that are falling apart and healthcare and so on and so on. So, you know, what we're up against is you know trying to get people who have a lot of money to do the right thing a lot of the time. You know. And people's minds can be changed. I mean, you know, I stopped taking heroin so they can stop profiteering <laughs> by your, yeah. you know what I mean? So, My, uh, my sister um, is a GP and she's just uh, sort of WhatsApped me a question. Mm -hmm. And she's asking, how do you feel uh, current service provision could be structured differently to achieve better outcomes? Well, I know what, what's worked for me. And one of the ways was to have um, this tri system, I think it's what's it called, tri something rather, where you have patient goes to doctor, doctor does the prescribing, that doctor is in connection with the counsellor, and the patient is also seeing that counsellor. So there's there's a kind of family of support going on there, um, and that's one thing that you know is quite useful. Um, I think involving drug users in what goes on in terms of the development of treatment services also quite useful. And you know, you get some very dynamic ex-users who don't want to do anything else but help people who are still using. And of course, because they have the, um, you know, the strength of saying, look, I have been there, I have got some idea what you're going through and the role modeling, it can be quite powerful. I mean, I know just quickly to say for myself, I was being assessed for rehab back in the 80s and um, I showed up at the interview, probably not exactly sober, and at the end of the interview, this guy Steve said, so if you're so keen and committed to coming off drugs, why did you show up here stoned today? And I was frozen, I was like, oh, I'm not stoned, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he said, look, Andrea, I used for 20 years and you are stoned and if you really want to get into rehab. Anyway, his next sentence, I. I didn't even listen to because I was staggered. Mm. You know, here's this guy, he's a social worker, he looks perfectly healthy, and he's just told me that he used injection drugs for 20 years. And it literally turned my world upside down because I didn't know there was an entity called an ex-user before that day. And the hope was then planted in my soul that maybe this could be me too. So, you know, at the moment, the user groups in this country are not user groups, they're ex-user groups, and some of them are really inclusive and helpful in terms of helping people still out there. But um, the wider community feel quite excluded, so people who are active and aren't necessarily at this point interested in coming off drugs, it's a problem. Um, and there used to be a National Drug Users Development Agency in this country so we have had better models which are more inclusive and so on and so on which will you know not only be about promoting abstinence um i think your question is one that i can't really answer much more than that um i think that you know generally speaking from my experience of working in the field there never seems to be enough connection between all the different stakeholders you know whether it's a housing situation yeah. or a prescribing situation or a hiv hospital so on and so on and so that's something that i think needs a great deal and also gps to prescribe i don't know if your sister's aware of the um sms group who are a group of gps in this country who come together they have their own conference every year and they talk about you know all the issues involved in uh, prescribing as GPs because 
lots of GPs are quite frightened of prescribing because, you know, if one person gets methadone from them, they're afraid they're going to be inundated with patients who need methadone and they don't necessarily know uh, how to treat us. So, you know, and so that conference essentially works as a training ground for that, for that group of physicians who are concerned. I'm not sure that I can say much more about that. It feels like um, there needs to be more of a holistic sort of solution. Uh, and I think that's, um, I think it's apparent in all sort of aspects of health and social care, um, wh whatever the issue uh, might be. So, because uh, I mean, there was a social care talk by um, Global Net uh, 21 mm -hmm. yesterday, and they were saying the same sorts of things, um, you know, about, you know, a network of carers, um, social care being linked more to the health service and them coming under one umbrella. And I think it's, yeah, I mean, where you have drug use, you've got, um, you know, you, you have your healthcare providers, you've also got um, housing, the police, mm -hmm. uh, and even if they're younger, colleges and, uh, and schools, potentially. Yeah. So, because uh, you've you've also got to think, you know, that you've a number of drug users have children, and they're also um, affected by their parents' drug use or a sibling's drug use. Yeah. But I mean, it's all all these sorts of issues. Um, that yeah. So I mean, in terms of harm reduction, that's that's another uh, sort of question. Um, is there support for families and? Uh, for the children of drug users is, does a, that sort of come into it there's a non-governmental organization called adfam who are particularly set up to help families and support families with drug use you know that's problematic and drink as well um again this is not part of my expertise uh but adfam is there and uh, you know it's been there for decades now um just as a note on that really uh families are not encouraged to en enable if you like people who are drinking destructively or using drugs destructively because what we find over and over again in fact our family's just gone through this not so long ago is if we give people money when they become destitute or whatever it's largely you know it's a stopgap. it's another plaster on the seeping wound that needs much more care um, so people are really encouraged to say look we're here for you we'll support you but you need to start getting some help for your addiction problem you know um, because you know we're not we're not doctors ourselves we're not counselors and so on and so on so in other words you know support don't punish <laughs> which is a global campaign you know, that we have a um, rally outside Parliament every June 26th that the International Drug Policy Consortium have instigated three years ago, which is getting some, you know, momentum, and that's encouraging. I mean, another thing that I haven't mentioned that I think it's important is that uh, drug testing is beginning to get uh, traction again which is brilliant. So people know what they're taking. The drug is tested before they, especially if it's an hallucinogen or something like ecstasy, because, you know, they last for hours. So at least if they know that it's largely what they paid for, they're, they're not likely to, um, and also that the dose is not too high or too low for that matter. Um, yeah. 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 We we are just about to be there. Peter, would you mind to mention your question here? Colorado got a benefit from legalizing marijuana, mm -hmm. which was an enormous increase in their tax revenues. Yes. Now, yes. Trump, the religious right, and all those other nutters will mm. probably kill that at the federal level for everybody. But mm. And also because they're jealous of the tax dollars coming in. They want their hands on it. <laughs> so that, that was my comment on that. So, Elizabeth, do you have anything else you would like to add before we close? No, just listening to Peter there, and we know we know in the UK, for example, that the costs of tobacco 
uh, in ill health, rubbish collection, da 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 da, way exceed the tax revenue. So uh, I would be cautious about that possibly happening with cannabis, but who time will tell. Yeah. You were talking about hallucinogens and their yeah. help in psychological distress and trauma. That's right. And mm. end of life issues. And the Beckley Foundation, Beckley, mm. yeah, Beckley Foundation, based in Oxford, are funding a lot of research into this kind of stuff. Really? I'll um, look that. Yeah, yeah. So do look them up. I will um, do. Very yeah. interesting. There, I mean, in fact, there are increasing numbers of these research protocols going on. So mm. you know, there is reason to be hopeful but i think you know the whole picture needs to be bolstered by people working closer together and building building a movement yeah because this discussion has been recorded so it will be um, published and people other people can listen to it and they may come back with questions okay um well, thank you very much and uh, have a lovely evening